we'll talk about is what is the Google Web, Web Toolkit. I'm really going to concentrate on an extension to the Google, Google Web Toolkit, their, their charting tools. Then we'll look at some of the code, and then if the, the demo gods are behaving, I'm going to do a, a live demo, which actually has to go over the internet and everything. So it's, we'll keep our fingers crossed. So what is it? According to Google, uh, their mission is to radically improve the web experience for users and developers using Ajax. Um, I started using the Google Web Toolkit in the spring, had a, a client who was really a, a Java shop, old school Java shop, and they wanted to move to using some new Ajax stuff. Um, they first wanted to just do some simple suggestion boxes as you're typing, it pops things up, um, but then they wanted to do some real, real time charts, which is where I started doing this, which as I started playing with it, I was like, this is kind of really cool. Um, just kind of wanted to tell everybody about it. Um, so just a, a real quick history lesson. Um, the web applications as we know them today really started back in the early 90s, Tim Berners-Lee, um, with HTML, standard style sheets back in the day. Um, moved on to doing CGI forms, JavaScript, right? It, but it was, everything was still relatively static. Uh, where you had a single form, you hit a button and you'd post back to the server, you'd process the request on the server, it'd come back and you just, you know, back and forth communication and you'd be constantly reloading the page. Um, everything was really static on the web side. Uh, or, or on the client side, where you had this basic HTML, you could do the view source, you could see everything that's going on. It was all kind of cool if you actually want to learn HTML. But then people wanted to start doing more and more things, so Flash came on the scene, gave you a lot more options for doing interaction, interactive web development. Um, but the downside of doing all that is you had to get this Flash plugin, um, which now with Apple and everything saying, no, we want to go to HTML5 and everything. It's, you know, it, it is a downside of having that plugin, which is where Ajax came into play, um, of being able to do the asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Uh, this allowed, even though the technology's been there, it just kind of came together in the, you know, five, six years ago, where people really started using Ajax to be able to do real-time updates to the, the content on your web page without having to reload the entire page. Um, it you know, seems like a simple concept now, but when we fir first started seeing everybody doing it five, six years ago, it was like, oh, that's pretty cool, where you just see this one piece start updating based on what you're doing on the rest of the screen. So it gave it a completely different paradigm of having your single form, and when you're doing, pushing a button on one part of the page, it'll go off asynchronously, call the back-end server, um, get the re response back and not have to repaint the entire form. Saved a lot on your, your bandwidth and, and just gave a better overall experience to the user. Um, which is where the Google Web Toolkit came into play. As, like I, I, as I was learning more and more about it, I was like, oh, this is really cool. But then Google gives you an easy way of doing it. Um, it gives you the rich interfaces in order to be able to create all the, everything through widgets and panels. You do get all the asynchronous communication without you having to build all the JavaScript by hand and being able to process it on the server side and, and ha handling all that communication back and forth. Um, it does everything through standards, so this way if you want to pop something else in, it's fairly easy to do. And at least for me, everything is done in Java. Um, I'm a Java guy and a, a C guy, and I know Java pretty well. And my client was a Java shop, so it made it very simple in order to bring that in. A lot of the things you could do with the Google Web Toolkit, specifically around the charting tools, even if you got PHP or Ruby inside your shop, you could still do that through pure JavaScript. But what we'll talk about today is just doing it in Java, because uh, that's what I know best. And what the Google Web Toolkit gives you is really a bunch of widgets in order to be able to build your pages. Um, it gives you static widgets that you put inside of different panels. So you're, you're, you have a group of static widgets, which are your labels, your images. These are all things that aren't going to change by something the user's doing. You could change it programmatically. So if your, your code changes the label or changes an image, you could do that. But the user isn't doing it. You have to program it to do that. They also have the form widgets, which get the user interaction. So you have the buttons, the check boxes, list boxes. You've got a bunch of them. So as you're building your pages, 
if, some, if somebody used to be an old VB developer where you're drawing the different things or power builder, same sort of thing of being able to draw your, your different GUIs, just doing it through uh, a, a, in a web page as opposed to doing a, a client-based application. And everything just goes into a panel. Those are your containers. So now that I gave you a, a, a kind of a, a real quick overview of the Google Web Toolkit, now I'm going to show you the cooler stuff. That's basic UI. Um, if anybody's a, a UI developer, those are different things that's common there, whether it be Swing, Visual Basic, any of that other stuff that was there. The charting tools is a separate add-on to the Google Web Toolkit. They have a, a number of different add-ons. And what you do is it's a separate jar file that you load into your project. It's also known as the Visualization API. Um, there's a ton of different charts, and I'll show you a, a bunch of them. Um, the downside of this particular plugin or this additional uh, add-on is you actually have to be online for it to work, which is why I need the internet connection. Um, if, because what it does is it actually makes a call to Google in order to download a little bit of uh, JavaScript. It's, it's open source, you could get it, but their license says you can't make it stand alone on your laptop. I don't think they'd go after me putting it on my laptop right now for a demonstration, but you never know, you know with the different lawsuits going on these days. So your, your different charts, um, you could visualize any sort of data that you really want. Um, with, with this, it gives you a bunch of different options. You have the standard uh, bar charts, line charts, uh, pie charts, you got area charts, you have the combo charts. Um, gives you all these cool colors. You could kind of hover over them and it gives you, give you what the values are just by like hovering over it. All that stuff's all built in where you don't actually have to code it. It's like you, you, you basically define what the chart looks like um, and it gets you all that stuff. But that's, you know, the, you pay the price of making that call to Google in order to get that bit, bit of JavaScript. You get scatter point charts, uh, candle box. Uh, you got the, uh, the regular tables. You got some pretty cool, cool ones where you could do the geographical one. So if you want to see, you know, based on the, the geospatial stuff, you know, populations or, or whatever, you have that for the, the geospatial stuff. You have gauges, which is essentially the simplest chart because it's a, a single value, um, but you get the nice speedometer effect. And then there's a bunch of other ones uh, that just add on. Whether some of them are interactive, some of, some of them are the same as, as uh, you know, for instance, the um, the, dream, the map map chart here. That one's actually as an image. So if for whatever reason you don't want the interactive stuff, you want to be able to display it as an image, you could do that as well. You know, they have that little train over there. You could have custom images in order to create your bar charts. Um, they got you know, dozens of different chart types to be able to add to your application. So downloading it, so when you get the slides later, um, just get it from the Google Web Toolkit uh, website and the visualization API is also on the Google, uh, Google site. So I gave you a little bit of background. Let's look at the code. So the easiest way to get started is inside the Google Web Toolkit, there's a, a web app creator which creates the uh, the scaffolding essentially for the project itself. Just running it with the name of the project and what the package is gonna be will create a full Java project for you. And the big thing to realize is it actually splits things to, into two different categories, a client and the server. Because you're creating a single web application, but a lot of your code and a lot of the logic that you're gonna build is actually gonna run on the client inside the user's browser itself. So that's why you, you have to separate everything. So the client is actually going to make the, the remote procedure call out to the server. Even though everything's all in a single, uh, a single project and you're writing everything where it's all in a single package, essentially, when you deploy it using the Google Web Toolkit, it's going to actually separate everything out. It's going to basically turn all your Java code into a bunch of basic HTML and JavaScript and CSS on the client side. And then all, everything on the, the server side is going to run as a Java server. So that's why everything's kind of separated into two different areas. And then you have your configuration file, that XML file. So in order to add the visualization API, you have to you know, tell it to load it inside the, the config file, inside that XML file. So you just have to tell it to put the jar file in the right lib directory and tell it to load the visualization API. 
Now, when you want to add the charts for the visualization API, because it, this is one of those weird ones that actually make the call out to Google, um, you have to start up the charts in a slightly different way. You have to create it in a, a separate runnable container. Um, so this is why you're, you're, I'm going to be creating these things and then you add it at the end. Um, so what I'm going to do is create a simple gauge um, because it's the simplest thing to add. First, you define it with a, a set of options. You create a, an, an options object. You set the width, the height, and then you set the, the gr uh, yellow, green, and red numbers. So we'll go from the whole range is from 0 to 5,000, and then it'll also draw the colors on there for you. Now, in order to add any data to it, it's really a simple data table object. We're going to create a single row because a, uh, a gauge only has the single, single thing to worry about. So it's, when you're setting a value, it's a row, it's a column, and then the value. Those are the three numbers, zero, zero, zero. Right, so we're going to start to initialize everything you know, fr from a zero position. Then we'll create the gauge. And we'll add it to a panel, right? because that's the container. And then after we have that all in its own self-contained container, none of that's going to run until you actually bring it up and it runs on the Google side of things, right? So that's why you have to do this separate call, the load visualization API. And you have to tell it which packages you're going to do. Um, for the visualization API, this is the, the one awkwardness of being able to deploy it because you have to do it knowing that you have to reach out to Google in order to get the right JavaScript loaded on the application. If you're going to create a regular button or, or anything like that inside the Google Web Toolkit, you don't have to go through this weirdness. This is just for the visualization API. I, I think Google just wants to be big brother and monitor who's using their stuff. Next thing you have to do is add a timer. Because everything's asynchronous and everything's really driven from the client, if we want this thing to be monitor everything real time, we need something to kick off an event. So you add a timer where once a second it's going to try to get new messages. This could be some uh, user clicking a button, it could be any, anything. Timer is a good way to regularly, for, for charting, be able to check for updates. So we'll, we'll kick off a, team, a timer once a second. And then what, what that get messages, what it'll do is it'll process the results. Um, it makes the remote procedure call. It's actually calling the greeting service, which is the servlet on the server side. And then it'll process the results. So on this on success method, it gets back a string. That's the results. Everything with the Google Web Toolkit, as you're talking between client server, is a string. It's all XML. Um, and the results that's coming back is the return value of the remote procedure call. Um, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll split that, because I'm actually sending back two results. Um, so using the Java split uh, string method there, I'll take that result and actually split it into uh, a string array, because so I'm, I'm going to get back two values. I'm going to be putting in two gauges. Um, and I'll get back the values for the withdrawals um, from the result, the first, first value there. Then in order to repaint that, um, that gauge, what you have to do, you have to get the instance of that gauge, and you have to create a new data table with the new value of a withdrawal. So it's still 0, 0, because it's the first row and row column. And then we have the new value of withdrawals. And then we just have to repaint that or redraw that gauge so this way everything's updated. You know, so you get the nice, nice effect of that gauge moving. On the server side, this is the servlet that's running completely on the server. This is where we're going to be interacting with Postgres. It's uh, fairly simple where I'm just going to use the PG Bench um, schema where you know, for the withdrawals and deposits is I'm just going to you know, do the average of the deltas inside the history table over the course of time. Um, so this way, you know, gives me a number that moves over time. Don't do this if you're actually running, the, doing something like this in production. Because I have a timer hitting this once a second, and you know, just for simplicity, I'm creating a new database connection every second and then closing it down. <laughs> Use connection pooling, right? This is just for examples only. But I have to give you that warning because I've had people kind of copy and paste my code and say, hey, why do I all of a sudden have all these connections on the database and my database is going slow? <laughs> Don't do that. I just wanted to demonstrate that I am actually connecting to a Postgres database um, because uh, you know, it is just a simple JDBC connection. 
I'm executing that query, um, and then I'm, you know, in this particular case, I'm closing it. Don't close it, keep those connections open if you're polling once a second. Right. And then this is where that colon comes into play. Uh, I'm sending back in that return value the withdrawals and the deposits. It gives me a way to parse things out on the other side. When I'm writing produc production applications, generally what I do is when I'm sending back values like this, I wrap it in a JSON string. Um, it's, a, it's a nice compact way in order to send it back and there's libraries on both sides in order to parse it and create the JSON strings. Uh, it's better than just creating an arbitrary delimiter of a, a colon, um, but this is just for, for demonstration purposes. Um, JSON works extremely well for doing that, and that's generally what I do when I'm writing stuff for, for clients. So now let's keep our, our fingers crossed if the, if the internet connection's still up here. All right, so this is what the gauge looks like. Hopefully everything is still working, right? So just running PG Bench, I'll run a single connection and a single transaction, and that moves, right? It's constantly being updated as I'm doing this. Right? You know, if we run 10 connections and say, you know, 1,000 transactions, what PG Bench does is it keeps running random numbers around the number between zero and 5,000. So everything should kind of converge around 2,500. But this is real-time update is as a PG Bench is running, you have everything entirely running in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. There's no flash, everything's running entirely real-time and you get real-time updates and you see the different gauges moving um, over the course of time. This is why I, I, I ran this from my client. They didn't want to use Flash, they wanted to have real-time updates, um, and they wanted to be able to show their customers different values of their sales as they're going along. Um, so it's all great on different monitoring situations. If you want to monitor Postgres and be able to put different dashboards and gauges up really easily. Um, the, the line graphs are pretty cool too, where you see them moving over the course of time. Um, or the, the geographic ones as you change them as, you know, North America gets lighter and Europe gets darker and stuff like that over the course of time as different values change. It makes it very, very simple in order to be able to create the web application on top of that without having to use Flash or you're just essentially using Ajax and you're writing everything in Java. Again, if you want to be, if you have PHP or Ruby and use these gauges, um, you can. You can kind of do, entirely do it through JavaScript itself. Um, it's just, I didn't know that side nearly as well as I knew the Java stuff. It was a lot simpler for me to do. So, thank you, Demo Gods. It did work. <laughs> Thanks, guys.